So what will happen today is that we will discuss the, it's our last meeting dedicated to this chapter on destructive plasticity. And then we'll proceed to a chapter on love and sociality. Um, in, uh, in this part of the book, what I'm uh, talking about is uh, discussing is Zizek response uh, to start with Zizek response to Catherine Malabu um, introducing the concept of destructive plasticity. And uh, Zizek tries in response to introduction of this concept, he would try to rehabilitate psychoanalysis claiming that you don't need to go um, outside of psychoanalysis like Malabo aims to go to uh, conceptualize what she wants to conceptualize because he claims that in psychoanalysis uh, already in Freud, especially in Lacan, uh, what she's trying to look beyond psychoanalysis is already present there as central, meaning the death drive is central, which is a strange move for me. Why? was the problem with going beyond psychoanalysis and um, trying to say something that was in psychoanalysis you're not able to say so and by this move uh, Zizek claimed that it's already central he brings the those who would claim that Thanatos is uh, like transcendental principle so it's inside the death drive is inside uh, it might be unconscious and eros or pleasure principle what stands for pleasure principles it's the way it's externally functions, like a, psych a psychological principle or something. But so within meaning that pleasure principle uh, that Malabu wants to overcome, it's like um, it doesn't mean if it's present uh, that it's central. It still can be something secondary, and the death drive is a true substance of what is going on. Meaning, uh, the actually the death drive as central in psychoanalysis work that there is this self destruction or destruction going on is just outside for us it's present as a pre pleasure principle like there is a trick in the pleasure principle uh, for me it's problematic this attempt to rescue psychoanalysis because even if we claim that uh, pleasure principle is on the outside and it's secondary it still there it mm, suggests that the subject is uh, even though driven by the death drive but this death drive is unconscious it's like something we are not aware of and it's still the subject of the pleasure principle still in pursuit of pleasure so even if it's the pleasure doesn't the pleasure principle is um disrupt because of the death drive the death drive is kind of its disruption but it's still the subject of the pleasure principle and uh the whole idea was to overcome uh the pleasure principle even if it's uh, there is a trick inside the pleasure principle. It's still the subject in pursuit of pleasure. And in my view, my attempt was not to conceptualize it as the a subject of pleasure in pursuit of pleasure. And for, for this, I would, would um, refrain from mentioning pleasure in discussing the actual subject uh, with the centrality of the death drive within the subject. And one of the examples that Zizek would to use would be uh, Jewish sons. Um, Lacan's term, which uh, shows this principle, like there is the, uh, there is um, always pain to a pleasure. So Jusan's presupposes both. It's mentioned in the context of both pleasure and uh, pain, meaning that uh, there is. It's quite pessimistic because it admixes pain. In when we describe humans through this concept, it admixes pain to any pursuit of pleasure, to any ple pleasure. It um, presents pleasure as um, something that involves pain. It's quite pessimistic, uh, something that it's impossible to attain. But my, so for Lacan and um, Zizek would claim that it's already beyond the pleasure principle because it is a death drive kind of or something that's driven. But my problem with this concept is that it still, even if it discloses pain, the true essence of um, the pleasure principle, the true essence of pleasure, or admixes inevitably uh, pain to pleasure, it still talks about pleasure. Like it's still there. Even if it's something impossible, it's still um, the pursuit of pleasure 
is something that defines us. It's still, it, you cannot, in, initially, jouissance means the pleasure. It was only later that uh, Lacan started to problematize it and add uh, pain to it. So for me, the problem was using jouissance as the uh, example of a work of a death drive or equalizing it to a death drive is that it admixes pleasure, even if something impossible to attain, even if something that has the um, pleasure that has pain to it, it still talks about pleasure, it still works in the context of a pleasure and therefore of a pleasure principle. Something, uh, pleasure principle is here something that uh, failing, but it's still the pleasure principle, it's not beyond the pleasure principle. And you cannot, if you want to discuss human suffering, uh, if you really, um, want to discuss the subject of the death drive you cannot admix pleasure into discussion uh, neither even if uh, something impossible because it still puts it in the context of the pleasure uh, even if um, even if you claim that uh, jurisans conceptualizes pleasure as inevitably presupposing pain right it's still inevitably discussion of pain in this context presupposes the opposite that it entails pleasure or there is some pleasure to it or at least the pursuit of pleasure so it's um, impossible to conceptualize the suffering human being to actually see suffering uh, through this concept uh, with the admixing even instead of getting rid of the idea of a pleasure principle because we're still ending up talking about pleasure when the pleasure is irrelevant in of when you're discussing actual suffering it's like escape mechanism that doesn't allow us to fully recognize um, human suffering still brings the pleasure uh, what about pleasure <laughs> like it's uh, which makes it uh, which makes it more bearable but um, at the same time problematic mm. and hegelian dialectic this is what i like about Jizik, the way he transforms it into um principle of absolute recoil so what uh, Zizek would transform in uh, Hegelian dialectics is this is how uh, normally Hegelian dial dialectics is represented and Zizek would criticize this comprehension conventional comprehension of um, he Hegel's uh, dialectic calling it evolutionary theology and um, its negativity is present here only in this antithesis so there is something positive, presence of thesis of something, then uh, negation occurs, the thesis is negated by antithesis. So uh, negation occurs here, but this negation uh, is erased through the next step of synthesis. Like they both, here they contradict each other and they both get sublated into uh, other presence something positive and then the whole thing repeats so uh Zizek would this is the scheme for everything the theological scheme for everything like what happens in our life for example there is something um then there is the negation of the something a certain loss or forever negative and but then we um put it the whole story into a framework that this is for the better and there is some other uh, formation that occurs out of it. So, or the idea that there is the evil and good in the world, there is God, um, God and uh, evil, devil, and but the whole thing of devil uh, corrupting the work of a God is God's plan, for example. And we use this framework to uh, to describe life like the generally positive framework in which we fit any negativity as something that's going to be conquered or uh, subject of for overcoming through like larger positivity. Uh, Zizek criticizes this conventional perception of uh, Hegelian dialectic uh, teleological perception and uh, suggests that instead of what he calls uh, he's performing Freudian Lacanian intervention into the comprehension of Hegelian dialectics. And uh, he emphasizes, and uh, he claims that um, the whole point of it is not to, of this scheme of this comprehension of Hegel is not to recognize that uh, something gets erased, the con content, content is um, gets 
radically erased. It's always there is this preservation, a mechanism of preservation and uh, progress, even if progress includes, um, if it's even if it's nonlinear. For Zizek, uh, he wants to introduce the ruptures and the um, something that is radically erased. And for him, this uh, sometimes it's presented um, as a uh, one line um, and uh, as a spiral, for example. So it's and it goes up. It's like general improvement, and everything that is bad and uh, this goes down. It's just for next step of uh, improvement that incor incorporates the negation, right? So. For Zizek, it's impossible to draw <laughs> what Zizek talks about, uh, his idea of, gen of absolute recoil, uh, but it's about the empty space. So at the same time, it's impossible to present it, uh, schematize it, but at the same time, wherever you present, if there is an uh, empty space, it perfectly represents it because representation is an empty space. It's like you cannot present it. You cannot uh, use lines because it's about not about the line, the presence, but about the what is absent in between the lines. So whatever you put there, if it's empty space, it works as representation of absolute recoil. So um, for Zizek, uh, he develops uh, absolute recoil as the substitute for the logical reading of Hegelian dialectics, which includes the uh, rupture, which include the radical erasure, non-teleological principle that uh, works uh, through ruptures when the uh, past gets uh, erased and it's not preserved. It's through the rupture that it's uh, would something is established, uh, both past and the future, right? Retroactively rewrites itself. And this is how uh, story history works and personal uh, stories work. Uh, so it's becoming as the moment of nothing to nothing. It's this nothing that is constitutive, that is actually at work, that it gets constantly, something gets constantly erased. And through this erasure, things uh, work. So absolute negativity, he actually recognizes the uh, negativity through this principle or like how something works through loss or through um, through lack, through traumatic uh, interruption. And this scheme uh, allows to recognize the truly traumatic matter, part of the matter of existence. <clears throat> While conventional Hegelian dialectic doesn't allow to recognize it, it's like uh, escaping it all the time, ignoring the nothingness, ignoring the uh, erasure, full erasure. And uh, this would also correspond to uh, something Zizek likes to talk about, bringing Lacan into consideration when uh, Lacan's theme for subject is already post-traumatic subject, meaning there is this lack or crack in, the, in our existence and this lack is uh, constitutive. So, when we talk about absolute recoil in relation to a subject, the personal story of the subject goes also occurs through complete erasure, uh, through occur through repetition of lack or repetition of loss, so falling into nothingness, then uh, then movement from from the nothing to nothing. So the lack, uh, complete erasure uh, is constitutive for the subject life narrative. But uh, recognizing this uh, and uh, conceptualizing something like absolute recoil, uh, Zizek nonetheless would use the language of uh, recovery from trauma. For example, in here, he would talk about uh, trauma survivals, people from Sudan or Congo. It was quite a while ago uh, before present uh, wars, but still we can see that in his language, he would still refrain to, uh, he would still talk about the possibility of, uh, the possibility of uh, rehabilitation of trauma. And he would distinguish people who are traumatized uh, and from those who can find the retreat uh, from their trauma. And he is talking, from a position uh, of someone who is 
not traumatized. It is here. He is juxtaposing, contrasting himself um, and us. Uh, he's talking about us to develop West, <laughs> me especially, um, to those who are trauma survivors, who even though he recognizes and in psychoanalysis, uh, this idea of uh, Lacan's post-traumatic subject would be recognized. But still, even Lacan would talk about the possibility of non-post-traumatic uh, subject, like subject who is not uh, the product of a trauma of complete subject, maybe as a result, for example, of psycholytic uh, uh, work or as some as a, a animal state that precedes the uh, trauma of language of symbolic order. So it still presupposes this conception, uh, both Zizek and Malabu still presuppose, they preserve a hope that there is the uh, something or someone that is not product of trauma, the product of ra rapture. And there is something of us, at least that we can overcome this trauma, that the stuff can, can function not through the principle of absolute uh, recoil. And with Malabu, it's the, her goal actually is to discuss a certain group of people who are the product of destructive plasticity, those who are um, the living dead, right? And um, Zizek seems to, what was the goal for me is to um, extrapolate, to extend the concept of destructive plasticity to include everyone. Like to include uh, any human life seen as the product of uh, the death drive and of destructive plasticity of just destruction in general without any uh, any hope or any possibility of going anywhere beyond the process that um, in a process some kind of process that is different from um, from destruction and well, for Zizek, we can see that um, he would talk from the position of uh, someone who is uh, presumably not traumatized. And this is problematic for academic discourse, right? You cannot talk uh, from the perspective of someone who represents the trauma, who talks about the trauma. You need to pretend that you're not traumatized, otherwise you won't be uh, listened to, you won't be perceived as the... Um, as someone who is uh, valuable enough to listen to. Uh, there's going to be this protective mechanism at work that will reduce you to the your voice, to the product of trauma, to a voice of trauma. And this would be justification for you not to be heard. So what I did in a book is um, I was trying to present both, like fix this and present both as examples, uh, Zizek and Malabo as the living dead, to include them into this um, category of the living dead. Um, with Zizek, um, in his interviews and in general, in personal context, he would admit that he's an extremely depressed guy. And he would claim that uh, he wanted to commit suicide. We all know that, and he's he writing books is a way of, of postponing a suicide, and he keeps writing those books just the way or to postpone the uh, killing himself. And um, from this perspective, based on this, we can also comprehend him as the living dead. So he he did committed suicide. It was impossible for him to go on, and the only body that remains after uh, after this death is his text work, which he actually likes more than himself. And uh, he lives in a form, we can say, in the form of uh, his text and not anywhere beyond it. It's like his text is his body and whatever else is there, remains there, it's just the imitation of existence. So his post-traumatic, his books are his, um, his words, are his post-traumatic dead body, body and only body, right? I'm not going to show you the picture of Malabo here out of respect, but with Malabo, it's also um, based on how she um, presents the intention of writing her book is that uh, her grandmother was the person who um, made her think about the concept of destructive plasticity or 
destructive plasticity is something that creates its own forms. And um, which means for me that not only her grandmother is the example of the living dead, but it's also her words are the, and her concept, uh, her thinking is the uh, manifestation of the wound, right? That not only her mother was not able to recognize herself, um, there was this rapture in between who she used to be and who she started to be when she, uh, after she got diagnosed with Alzheimer, but also for Malabu, this, this rupture of um, the wound um, pain that she felt uh, losing her grandmother. And the text evolves around this experience. And also the reader can feel the pain of Malabu's uh, talking about her wound. So this work of destructive plasticity is not only work uh, that occurred in case of Malabu's grandmother, but also with Malabu herself. And um, she can be seen precisely because she's writing about it. Um, it can be seen the very process of writing and her as the living dead, as the work, the book can be seen as the work of destructive plasticity. So it's not only to include um, Zizek and Malabu uh, claiming that they are, they belong to the category of living dead, uh, just to say that um, any human being, any story can be seen as the uh, work of the destructive plasticity. And I think it's the last slide. Um, with some conclusions uh, saying that life is dying or enfoldment of death and enfoldment that goes through discontinuity. There is no continuity, there's just discontinuity that manifests itself, might manifest itself as continuity. And we lose something without which we cannot live and nonetheless we imitate uh, living as a living dead. And it's not only a certain group of people, those who survived uh, death, uh, but each of us, and I'm not sure anyone survived the death. We just keep leaving death, uh, rather pretending to live, and um, without any possibility of resurrection, any possibility of cure. And uh, at the core, life is catastrophic. And death and destruction is something that operates upon us and shaping us without anywhere beyond uh, we can escape this process. And now I can answer your question. I'll just stop recording it.